Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck. Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea my man can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, wh- why are you doing this? You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice. In. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's, huh? that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen. Listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, Or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life (laughs) after. I guess even you could find it. (laughs) No, that's stupid. You can't I know, say I'm not going to say that. Jesus, start Welcome over. to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. <laughs> I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. And this is The Life After. Hey, uh, so today is going to be a really cool episode because uh, we are going to be covering a couple of things we haven't covered yet. Okay, like, cool. Like one big thing that we're going to talk about is like polyamory. And polyamory. So I wanted to look at some of the different like relationships, um, models, Doesn't that just everything. mean you're like afraid of commitment? Oh my God, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> No, it doesn't, Chuck. I'm totally kidding. It totally means you have kidding. more than I'm, one heart. It's like Doctor Who. Let, may this be a coming out moment. I pretty, pretty, I'm pretty polyamorous. So, well, there we go. Now, you, now the world knows. So, if I make fun of polyamory, I'm also making fun of myself. But I thought it was an important thing because a lot of us coming from fundamentalist backgrounds, you know, we're taught that everything has to be one way. Yep. Um, but then, like, we realize, wait a second. Right. And one thing that was a transition for me is making room in my life for a new category that uh-huh. uh, purity culture did not teach me. And that is, uh, I have my question for you is what fears did you have before you had your first FWB? Oh, good question. What fears did you have? What were your um, expectations going in as a fun? I'm going to turn this ceiling fan off and then I'll answer it because I forgot to do that. <laughs> This is how the sausage is made. I mean, you know, initially it's like, like, okay, so you are taught that there is a, like one of the biggest things that you're taught is mm-hmm. this, the tape thing. Do you know the tape yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, where you lose your stick. Oh my fucking God, the fucking tape, man. Uh, yeah, so like the idea for- Which is weird for those sex of you is that, pretty sticky. For those of you with the privilege of not knowing what I'm talking about, it's like in in virginity school, <laughs> in in whatever church's version of quote unquote sex ed is, they teach you this. They teach you about oxytocin, which is a real bonding chemical, but they teach you that it like it like <laughs> degrades over time. Or I don't really understand the science of it, but if you if you stick a piece of tape to like many surfaces it gradually loses its stickiness right so the Mm -hmm. idea is that like if you have sex with a lot of people you're going to lose your ability to like emotionally bond with people um which is like 150 percent not true um well i not on a chemical level or on a i tend to believe that if god brady i tend to believe that if an analogy works on one level it's going to work on all levels (laughs) So, I, so you grew up in church, is what you're saying? Yeah, right. It's kind of like it's kind of like when you say the Bible is a love letter, but it also involves like threatening to kill you if you don't love me back. Right, right. Normalize it. That's how love letters should be. Then, yeah. Okay, that's what's on. a what's a love letter without a little genocide? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay, but what you're saying is like, We're really the, missing out the, the tape bullshit where you you somehow are losing part of your personality or heart or spirit. Yeah, you're like giving. It's like you're sexuality. giving away something that you can't get back. Is like the fear, right? Yeah, which is like totally not true, right? And as an experienced hoe. I now know this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's that was the first thing that comes to mind. 
I like that. I think there was kind of the same thing for me. I remember, you know, because I, I saved myself for marriage. I was, you know, very much a prude. Uh, I only kissed like two women in my entire life. And right. I was engaged. I to, waited till I was married also. Yeah, yeah. To, to, do, yeah, the, to do the sex. Be, all right. To do the sex. So, that's, that's great. So like I, you know, that was such a commitment and such a thing that was important to me. And so walking away from that and feeling like, uh, I was scared to death more for me. It was more of like a shame thing of like, Oh, I'm going to feel so bad after this. But then, you know, it happens and you're just like, Oh wow. But uh, you know right. what, what are some of the things that <laughs> oh, like, wow. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Oh, oh wow. Oh, oh wow. Oh wow. There Bobby. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> what have you learned or gained from like that sort of friendship or relationship? Uh, Oh Jesus. Yeah. Dude. A lot, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I, I don't know. Like you don't, uh, you just, uh, I don't even know where to start with that. It's just you, you, you gain whatever like that person has to offer you yeah. in the, you know, in, in whatever is appropriate and comfortable for everybody involved. One, so a I'm lot sorry. of things, man. I mean like anything that you can learn from any friendship or meaningful, yeah. intimate relationship comes from that too. And it's like, uh, I don't know. It, uh, but it's, it's also unique in a way cause you like have a sexual relationship with a person and, um, that gives them like a unique insight into you as a person and it leads to unique conversations and circumstances and you know, you learn all kinds of cool shit. I like that a lot. Yeah. One thing that was an interesting walk away for me that I think, uh, I wish I would have known earlier was that that human adults can communicate well. Uh, right. And I think that like so much of the fundamentalism it came from is said, here are these biases, these preconceived notions that we have about this sort of like sexual friendship or relationship. And then here are the prejudices that you're supposed to pick up. And then it's supposed to be, well, how do you know they're not going to fall in love with you? How do you know that it's not going to, how do you know? And it's like, yeah. the answer is, well, because you're able to communicate. Right. Um, and it's like, into that same tactic when it comes to like, well, how can we explain to our kids how the gays love each other? Well, really easy. <laughs> uh, you sit down and you speak to them on their level. Right. Right. You know, and so when yeah. it comes to friends benefits, like I have a benefit with it because I've got grinder of being a gay man of like we have those conversations usually over the messaging and everything. Right, so right, right. those expectations and stuff are there. And so when those are communicated and met, then you're not running into weird ass shit that yeah, yeah, fundamentalist yeah. culture told us that uh happens all the time and Yeah. But no, it's because you clipped your wings of communicating and then you're complaining that you can't fly. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean like you don't you don't have the the vocabulary to communicate about sex relationships in Christianity really. Like you're given very limited vocabulary. You're given like a, if you grew up in like a complementarian environment, you have like roles that are supposed to be fit you know it's like men need respect and women need affection and it's like fuck man that is like so oversimplified it's I've like painfully a, oversimplified i read a marriage book called love and respect yeah that yeah that yeah, same exactly that's exactly that's the book I, that was i was picturing in my mind when i said that so it's like Ugh. yeah but yeah com- communication is yeah and i was definitely a, a, a like there was a part of me that was like if christians are right which i'm pretty sure they're not then uh, this person might like fall in love with me and it might turn into a big dramatic thing. One of the things that I, I, I like, I'm still good friends with everyone I've ever had sex with on some level, you know what I mean? It's not like I, we talk every day or something, but it's like, you know, I don't know. I feel like there's this belief that if you have sex with many people, it will lead to many disastrous situations. And I'm not saying that, yeah. like, if you don't if you don't have a good relationship with everybody you've had sex with, that there's something wrong with you. I'm just saying that it's like it's possible. You we know, we were on <laughs> like, a break. We were so- on a break. Yeah. No. I mean, it's like communicate what you want. Communicate what you what's possible, and you know if and be you know objective about it. Right. Yeah. Find yourself. Find yourself. Inside of a lot of other people. <laughs> uh, well, for our guest today, we have uh, a, top a new friend, <laughs> a new friend, Caitlin. And uh, we're actually going to connect with her here in a moment uh, through satellite. Uh, through satellite. Chuck, can you add sound Space effects? Force. Sound, add sound effects. Space Force. Bow, and, wow, and, wow, uh, wow, wow, wow. Oh, oh, oh satellite. she's coming in. I feel like I. 
She's coming in. They're coming in. God damn it. Uh, Caitlin, Caitlin, hello. This is Brady and Chuck. Uh, can you read us? Where are you, where are you, com- where are you calling us from? Can you read us? Orleans, Louisiana. New yeah. Orleans. Super cool. Orleans. And um, before we go on, can we please, uh, what pronouns should we be using? So I am fine with all pronouns. They, she, he, any are good for me um, because I identify as agender. Um, There's no box. There's no check. I don't have a check for a box. I'm, I'm cool with whatever. Fuck yeah. We are going to cover some really cool shit today. I'm so excited, yeah, listeners. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Life after. Today, we are talking about uh, coming from uh, some difficult backgrounds with homes, uh, mm-hmm. how fundamentalism gives into that. We're going to be talking about belief systems after fundamentalism, including witchcraft. We are going to be talking about polyamory we're gonna be talking about some really cool gender. shit today i'm excited yes throw some gender in there throw some gender in there uh caitlin G- gender bread we're making gender bread we're going to jump into your story right after this If you were going to die tonight, do you know where you... Stop. Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. (laughs) Thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. And welcome back to The Life After. We're here with our friend, Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin. Uh, question ah. for you. So you're in New Orleans. Did you grow up there? Or where are you from? Um, no, I did not grow up in New Orleans. I've been here. This will be my seventh year. Um, I moved here after undergrad from North Texas. So I grew up in Central Texas, went to school north of Dallas, um, and relocated right after graduation. Oh. And your introduction to fundamentalism christianity came from where and started when yeah so i grew up um southern baptist uh was religious my whole life was wanted to be baptized at age five and my mm. folks actually didn't think i understood the seriousness of it yet and then okay. i waited like another four years and got baptized with my younger sister um so as far back as i can remember my my dad and i did bible story time every night and prayed together every night what yeah word i got i got i had the same uh i wanted to get baptized too young and uh my parents made me wait and then i had to take a a baptism class and i was (laughs) and i was homeschooled so this was like a this is kind of a weird side thing but like i i you make a lot of friends like temporary ones when you're homeschooled so i had to take this class with a bunch of people my age for like 12 weeks so i could get baptized i took it i was the only one that got baptized the following like as soon as it was over what i don't ask me why i mean this is like fail out of the quiz the story of being homeschooled is the story of perpetually being out of the loop with what your peers are doing so (laughs) i'm not surprised about that part but i was the only one to get baptized and then i I, like all of the friends that i made i basically just (laughs) never saw again (laughs) so what kind of church or at least not for another two or three years when i joined the youth group what kind of church had a baptism class was that your baptist it was a it was a non-denom non-denominational okay 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 for sure. so, anyway, that's a so, that's random. So again, like it was like super part of your family. I mean, or just your whole home life. It sounds like. Oh gosh, yeah. No, I mean, we went we went to church. Um, not every Sunday. My mom was uh, chronically ill. Is chronically ill, and so her health sometimes prevented her from going. But even then, my sister and I would go with my dad a lot, and we would always go out to lunch after and like critically analyze like what we learned in Sunday school and what the message of large sermon was if we stayed for the full sermon Mm. yeah it was like a thing yeah it's i i always have to clarify when i'm talking about that part of my life that like we were 100 percent sincere like i was 
I was always aware that there, I felt like it was like really, really made uh, clear to us that there were people that weren't sincere and they were just showing up and going through the motions and we didn't want to be those people. Yeah. Um, but we also never were those people. Like we, I believed it very earnestly and sincerely. And I know my folks did as well. Um, and it was like, like I was a person who in high school felt God call me to put Bible verses in random students' lockers. Uh, Um, like, so I like on my own time printed out Bible verses on strips of paper and cut them out and then went through during like lunch and like put them in strangers lockers gotcha. because i like thought that was like an encouraging thing for me to do um huh. yeah so deeply deeply committed yes deeply committed <laughs> into it yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i i think that there's kind of this narrative sometimes that people who end up walking away from it there's almost this feeling that uh we weren't that committed or something but from what mm-hmm. we see in the show all the time and i and i i know that this isn't the first time that i've taken a moment to you know acknowledge this but it's a lot of times those of us who really took it so literal yeah. and so serious right um and right. so life-changing like when i was in high school on the last day of school my senior year i did the morning announcements and i legitimately talked about how you can have salvation uh in jesus like on the intercoms in my high school and like i felt right. like buck williams and the left behind books like being <laughs> you know rebellious for jesus and that thrill that i got from it and that feeling of oh i just did an outrageous thing for the lord yeah um kind of became a echo chamber for me because that serotonin jolt or whatever it was uh made me feel good and so when i did outrageous yeah. things and took things really serious then i felt good about it you know <laughs> did you relate to that as a fundamentalist oh god yeah no i definitely asked i think it was 10th grade for my birthday i just asked all my friends to come oh, to church with me. yeah um and like <laughs> what a nerd on it such a nerd (laughs) and like i look back it was a super affirming experience looking back because i had friends who i grew up outside of austin so um i had a pretty diverse friend group i had friends who were like atheist and friends who were catholic which isn't wouldn't think would be a big deal but it was a big deal that they wanted to come to my southern baptist church yeah 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 um and they like came and were polite and respectful to all of these people just like being weird and combative and like I even like that's a memory that i really cherish now because like those people those people loved me and like went and put themselves in this potentially uncomfortable situation yeah because i asked them to like i i feel like i feel super affirmed thinking about those friendships and and I'll, and many of them most of them aren't necessarily people who i still keep up with but i was just like like thank you like thank you for that gift of like doing that with me and for right, me right, even right. though you thought i was like completely <laughs> ridiculous like off yeah, the yeah, wall, yeah. right did you right, ever like, did you ever have any conversations with them about the experience uh since no no okay my my life is very heavily and we'll i mean we might talk about this more at length another time or maybe this is the time but I still don't think about leaving the church as a decision I consciously made. I like accidentally discovered I was queer and then it was like, oh shit, y'all like aren't gonna yeah, <laughs> y'all, you aren't, y'all aren't gonna hold me in this. Yeah. Like this space isn't for mm, me anymore. Right. And um and what was really disheartening was because I had been so earnestly committed and was a person like who was had a lot of leadership ability in that community and to have that just like like completely invalidated by something that I, I was reflecting on not even having been a conscious choice that I made. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was like super, it just, it made everything hollow. It made everything false. Sure. If like, you're not going to like, if yeah, you're oh, not going to sure, yeah. like hold me in this, then all of your, all of your bullshit that you're always yeah. talking about, like doesn't carry through. Mm. Um, I'm glad you recognize that right away. <laughs> Right. That was, that was the big, yeah, Yeah. it it doesn't work. It doesn't compute. Um, so yeah, I did. I have the, I had the benefit of thinking I was straight for a really long time. So I never had the like internal moral quandaries. Um, and then when I did, I, I had like a really deep, you know, conviction, uh, that 
<laughs> and I was like, I was like, well, y'all, you know, this is fucked up then. Like, y'all, this doesn't make sense. Because, um, if anything you were saying was relevant and, mm. and accurate and true, then, like, there would be space for me and my experiences sure. yes. and my story. I didn't understand that. Uh, so being oh, fundamentals, I grew up Southern Baptist as well and hearing all of the prejudice against gay people and then realizing that I am one of them despite my biggest efforts. And then to think, oh, well, the things that you said, the prejudice that I've picked up on, do I believe that about myself? Does that make, Yeah. is that true about myself? And then if we're not careful, we do kind of think well, there is something wrong with us because other people aren't having to deal with this on the same level. Or w what was that like for you to kind of fuck, oh, fucks with your so, head, right? Oh, it fucks with your head. It. I mean, so I was reading uh, like gay fan fiction erotica, like secretly at night mm -hmm. from like junior high through high school. Nice. And it was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, through college uh, through college yeah and it was this thing where like as long as it was about two people with penises then like it wasn't gay because oh, like i was yeah. not a person with a penis um what okay. wait what before you continue what kind yeah. of what brand of fan fiction was it oh star trek Lord yeah. of the rings yeah Harry potter um everything all Nerdy lots shit. of anime like oh oh next yes. generation Next Generation. I was OG. I was original oh, series. Oh, OG Star Trek. Born. Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. If we're talking about the quality of the series, then obviously Next Gen. But mm -hmm. um, my yeah. my yeah, fan yeah, fiction yeah. ship of choice was <laughs> all OG. Spot, what, what was it? Was I mean, it was, and, it was way Spot sexier, Kirk. let's be real. Spot Kirk, Kirk okay. forever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was one about... A lot of mind meld sex. It was very... Oh, it was a whole thing. That sounds next level. I gotta try some of that. Yeah, I mean, I could probably find mind some mind sex. <laughs> I've never tried. I've never tried. I feel like I've gotten there. I've had some. I've had some very quality. Some mind speaking, mind of, yeah. speaking of getting yeah. there, um, whenever they are, you know, Spock and Kirk. I bet you one of them goes, "Oh man, take me on a voyage home." <laughs> <laughs> and the other one goes, "Con." I'm just kidding. Oh, con. Con. I, yeah. Oh, anyway. I said cock. Okay. Cock. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll God, say we'll derail. change it to cock for this derail so that was kind of your outlet though was you had this oh, yeah. mine mine was uh chat rooms through through yahoo yeah. for the longest time it was uh the only thing that i had growing up as a teenager the only way and then i would feel so convicted and bad about it you know and there were right. even some people that i would talk to on a regular basis for a while and i had to go back and apologize and be like uh i'm actually a christian and and i would try to witness to them this how fucked yeah how fucked up is that that. Oh yeah, that was that's my favorite part of your your uh, growing up story Ugh. is that you you witness to your gay chat room lovers. So gross, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, to be fair, I was in an MMRPG. I was I was in a. It was called the Keep. It's very retro. It still exists. You can okay. find it in Nexus Chat. Sorry, I'm I'm giving them a shout yeah, out. They yeah, don't, Nexus they don't Chat. Know. Um, they don't but know. But I like got there and was chatting with somebody, and it wasn't sexual. It was barely flirtatious, and I panicked so hard that I just logged out for six months and never came back. And oh. so, like, I made this friend who like changed his profile to talk about how our characters were like beginning a flirtation, and uh -huh. I saw it. I was like, too much, <laughs> and I did, <laughs> <laughs> and just like did not do that again for like six to eight months. Um, One, yeah. So, so you kind of like, you kind of like avoided sexuality and romanticism like all together oh, 100%. IRL. I, there was this there was very much this like fixed discreet like hmm. like that is still something that i that i really struggle with is like being embodied and seeing myself mm -hmm. as a person with sexual mm -hmm. agency like yeah and uh, and a lot of that comes from just like not acknowledging it having a lot of shame around it and like sure. not engaging for a really long time and um I mean, some of that entwines with, like, the trauma and abuse I was experiencing at home. It's just, there's a level of vulnerability combined with any kind of sexual expression that, like, I struggle with a lot and has been a very long... I say that. I say that. I also have, like, group sex really regularly. So, like... <laughs> God, <laughs> right. There's, like a... But you gotta work up to it. Well, 
I have to work up to it. And for me personally, like, um, I have no idea how explicit the show is allowed to get. It's it's very difficult for me to get off. It's difficult for me to be present a long, sure. enough, long enough for that to happen. It's difficult for me to be the focus of attention. Um, it is, it's but, like, it is a big and abstract, like, thing to... Yeah learn how to be present in your body especially and it's like so weird because like our bodies are hardwired for sex in so many obvious right. ways mm. like we are more hardwired for sex than literally anything else that we do but like right. if it's still yet and still if you are so in denial about that for so many years it it takes a lot of i mean i would i would say that has been a journey for me for sure and it's Same. been from you know i mean yeah, not being able to get off in different situations to like, you know, I, too easily, too easily. Yeah, anything. yeah, that's yeah. a total. Yeah, that's a totally, that's a totally different thing. Or like, you know, a lot of my learning my sexuality was wrapped up in porn. Or like mm-hmm. for you know whatever whatever your outlet was as a kid is like kind of it that becomes kind of hardwired. So you got to let that right. go in those moments. And like, you can't write erotic fan fiction while you're getting it on with like three other people. So very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can try, I, you can try it. I, I have people who'd probably be into it, but yeah, it's, <laughs> even like, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I, my hopes and dreams, my go. sexual expression. Um, Love it. Yeah, I mean, even for me, like masturbation was this super shame-based thing sure. yeah. that was like, I need to, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna do it as quickly as possible and get it over with because yeah. like I can't be caught. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, even now, like the kind of stimulation that I need compared to my other partners with vulvas is like it's wild. Like I need like the max vibrator at ten. Like yeah, it's just it's it's really been interesting to try and like relearn my body. And it takes a lot of time and patience that honestly, when I just like would like to have an orgasm, like usually yeah. isn't worth it. Like I'd, I'd rather just go to the old standby <laughs> because it, then if there's other people present, it becomes a thing where I'm taking up a lot of space, which is another thing that's like super uncomfortable. Um, totally. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Go ahead. No, it's just a part of like finding that, yeah just finding yourself in your comfortable place within all of that it's not easy because it's so much different than what we were used to and we were brought up with and like you were mentioning before you said that it kind of wraps into your childhood and how things were when you were brought up do you mind if we ask about that yeah. or um, no not at all what, like, yeah. what was kind of going on there um yeah so i grew up my family was super tight-knit um, very, very close. Mm-hmm. We, um, my dad, I considered him to be my best friend for a really long time, um, into being a teenager. And also he, um, was verbally and emotionally abusive. Um, sure. I think he's, I, I think he's deeply depressed and I think he just mm-hmm. has never acknowledged it or sought treatment for it. He's very disparaging of, of mental health professionals and mental health care. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. So like we, we talked a lot about him, uh, having anger issues and being a deeply angry person. Um, and he was more physically violent when I was younger, um, in the sense of he punched holes in walls. That was, that was a thing when I was five ish, uh, he punched a hole in the wall. He threw the toilet on the front lawn and the computer. Those were before I was born. Um, but then as he got older, or as I got older, um, he was getting older too, I guess. Um, that wasn't as much of a thing, but very, very angry, very passive aggressive. A lot of like snipping comments, a lot of like stomping and slamming doors and slamming mm-hmm. cupboards and slamming cabinets. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just kind of a regular thing of like, he, he hated his job and I wish he had left. Um, but he worked there for like 14 years, 16 years, something wild, 24 years. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but he would come home and it was like this unspoken rule in the house. Not, it was spoken initially. My mom would like explicitly teach us like we don't engage with him for like at least an hour. Hmm. Um, and then even after that, a lot of the times, like the evening was really defined by whatever he was upset about, whatever happened that he wasn't, um, satisfied with around the house. Um, and it was all just channeling this, like just deep, uh, deep upset and frustration that he had about where he had been in life. Um, yeah. And my mom, 
my mom was chronically ill, mm. um, is chronically ill, um, is mentally ill, and um, and he he didn't he doesn't have a support system. Like he had nobody, he had no peers to talk to about that. I think church yeah. was this really isolating thing because it was supposed to provide the relationships that had the kind of authenticity where you could be vulnerable about that yes. stuff. But like nobody was getting to that level. That's super so, like, real. Yeah, mm. I want to I want to pick your brain about that later. But continue. yeah. I mean, yeah, anytime. Um, <laughs> he, it, so, you know, as we've gotten older and we've had more uh, confrontations, more about being queer um, and my, my wife uh, than about <laughs> any of his behavior, um, it's been this thing that I, like, called him out. I was like, you don't have hobbies. Like, you don't have friends. Like, you need, mm-hmm. you, there's, you know, he's, I've never used the language of emotional incest with him. But, like, yeah, like, you're bringing all these things to me as your child. And, like, you mm-hmm. need mm-hmm. peers and friends to provide you support mm-hmm. and talk about yeah. these things. And well, how do you define emotional incest? Can you do that for our, our listeners? Sure. I mean, I, I can certainly try. Um, Google it, because it's. Important, but essentially, it's when your parents are coming to you, uh, confiding in you, and gaining emotionally intimate support from you. That's more appropriate from a peer or a partner, yeah. um, mm. somebody their age, somebody that doesn't have the relationship with you of a parent. Um, yeah. So, I mean, my example with my father would be: I had come home visiting from college, and we went out to pick up a pizza, and we're waiting for the pizza, and he's confiding in me that my mom isn't the woman he married anymore. Um, like isn't that person which is just like Mm. like uh, when you talk to any reasonable person they're like that is not where you have that conversation that's not who you have that conversation with like that's a completely unreasonable and inequitable emotional labor that you're asking from your child in that moment um but he doesn't know like he has no he he has he has no yeah, we could cycle in on I think it's I day. mean I think that's an incre- <laughs> I think that's super common in church because men are just so yes. discouraged from like I mean they try really hard to be like we're doing this men's group and this men's conference and stuff but it's like you can't take a weekend and undo the barrage of the message that men are supposed to be like emotionless and stoic yeah. and then like throw them all in a room together and expect them to be vulnerable with each other. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Especially when you're in the same breath, you're talking about how they're the head of the household, and if they crumble, the whole house crumbles. Like, you can't do right, both. You, yeah. can't, you can't have them, like, not being allowed to fail, because it will reflect yeah. on the spiritual And not just not fail, but every... never show any vulnerability at all. Right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that is failing, right? Like, right. you can't, if, you, if you're being vulnerable, then your faith isn't strong enough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like... And from my experience, too, when you have this religion to kind of hide behind, you're not really getting vulnerable. Whenever you do finally start talking about these things, it's always behind this coded language that doesn't really get to the heart of what people are saying or feeling. You know, they're not, yeah. it's, oh, I'm struggling with this or I, this, blah, 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 blah. But when it gets down to like the real heart of the issue, that's such a stop up of vulnerability that right. isn't getting anywhere. Right. Mm hmm. So and so okay so that's uh, that's your dad. That's my dad. <laughs> we talked about your dad a lot. So what? So uh, where were you in that? Like, how did you fit in? What? What? How did that affect you in hindsight? And like, so I like like my my younger sister and I had very different experiences uh, with my mom's health. So I knew her as being healthier um, and more able to get around and being more mentally present longer. Um, and so I didn't, I, I didn't have a lot of frustration or anger with her when she couldn't do things because I think it was more clear to me as a kid that she didn't have a choice, but that like things had been taken from her as her, as her health had declined. Um, so I wasn't having conflicts with my mom. My sister had conflicts with my mom. She had a lot of frustration. So what my life looked like was like, uh, be a buffer between my mom and my sister and my dad be a buffer between my sister and my mom mm. try and physically care for mm. my mom mm. uh try and like provide domestic support around the house because without there being two able-bodied adults it was pretty much me and my dad maintaining like the five bedroom unnecessary house we lived in in central texas um so i'm i'm a chronic caregiver and mm-hmm. people pleaser there's like no space it, it is very difficult for me to to 
have needs and acknowledge I have needs, much less ask for them. Sure. Um, and all of that really got wrapped up in religious things because that was all praised. Like, especially as somebody socialized as a woman in church, that is li- like, that is, that is, you can't get a bigger gold star than constantly anticipating and fulfilling the needs of everyone around you. Mm-hmm. Like that's, yeah. that's like literally yeah, yeah, yeah. like what you're supposed to be doing all the time. So, um, my experience was church, although there was, I think I, I credit church with, with benefiting me in, in several ways, but like a, a lot of the greatest harm that was caused was just like perpetuating these toxic behaviors, yes. um, that I was picking, picking up at home in a home environment that wasn't operating in a super healthy way. And then just like getting lauded and praised for those same coping mechanisms mm. that like weren't actually serving me and weren't actually wow. protecting me. Um, mm. yeah, well into, uh, I mean, I 22, 22 is when any of that started, um, getting examined for me and unraveled for me. So a lot of my life was defined by performing that role well and knowing I was very good at it. And also knowing that like, it, it wasn't allowing me to be a priority in my own relationships. I saw a really important tweet, uh, recently about kind of the same thing about how, when we're kind of brought up around unpredictable, adults and we don't know how they're going to respond we pick up on these coping mechanisms that allows us to uh become an empath or a highly sensitive person which is how i identify Uh, and a lot of times we attribute this to like a magic that we have of like oh we have like a almost a magical level of intuition as an as an empath but really mm. a lot of times it's a coping mechanism of survival oh, of things that yeah. we needed to pick up on yeah. in order to survive yeah. when um, you grow up I with have... adults that can't functionally communicate their emotions you and you're around them all the them. time yeah right. you always have yeah. you have to learn how to read people like mm. really yeah. well really well yeah no, that definitely resonates. Yeah, I, um, I'm i incredibly good at anticipating other people's needs. It's very helpful as a teacher and as a special education teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm very good at my job. Um, and also in literally all of my personal life, like it's very frustrating. Um, once I catch myself doing that behavior and then also because before I was able to see the dynamic so clearly, I would resent that other people weren't doing the same for me. Like I would resent mm. that you're not trying to anticipate all my needs all the time and going above and beyond. Because it's like, always one-sided. You want that right, back, right? Right. And it's this real struggle with codependency of like, um, like I, I want to be able to do what feels good and provide you love and support. And also I need to understand that my framework for what that looks like fundamentally does not set me up for success in terms of an equitable partnership. Mm. Um, wow. It's a thing I'm still working on. And when you have multiple partners, it can become even more difficult because you just found more people to take care of. Um. Oh, damn. (laughs) You know, so I've I've noticed, like, it seems to me that a pattern that I've picked up on is that people who have abusive parents, particularly abusive dads, I think it's really, it's, like, easier to believe in the, biblical god right like it's easier to wrap your brain around the biblical god because you have a parent who like on one hand provides all of your basic needs and takes care of you and that maybe you have an intimate relationship with on some level but also like hurts you regularly and when you have this like super bipolar god in the bible that's like i love you infinitely but also i'll send you to hell if you don't you know do x y and z it's like that's i mean that is obviously an an abusive pattern that's like that is like textbook abuse yeah to be to like tread both lines like that but it's like when you have a when you have a dad that's like that you know it's easier to be like oh yeah it's easier to, to to be like how can god be both of these things it's like yeah i mean is that something Oh, 100%. It works in the other direction, too, where, like, so, I mean, I had a friend in college um, when we were both still believing very deeply that talked about that, about people with fractured father relationships, like, have a hard time relying on God, Um, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of a, a hot take. 
But like for me, from, <laughs> from the from the other direction, like I nobody, I was I was 22 before I realized my dad did anything fucked up. Yeah. Because for so long I was in this tight knit community where it was like, no, sometimes people who love you like do horrible things to you, but it's for your own benefit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And like that getting reinforced, like we weren't. I wasn't talking about it all the time. I wasn't talking about my, my dad's behavior, or like my mom being sick all the time, but there were people who knew like there were, I mean, there were, we, it was a regular occurrence to talk about my dad's anger issues, like, mm-hmm. um, with close friends. Um, and most of my closest friends weren't actually like my church going friends necessarily. Um, which is interesting, but, um, yeah, there's this there's this reverse too that like there's no there's no agency for you as a young person to point out when something is happening that's that feels harmful if like the god that's being reinforced as the moralizer of the universe like behaves like your father like there's wow. no mm. like outlet for a critique. He's being there. godly. Yeah. That action yeah. is godly actually by, being right. godly, yeah. So they right. kind of yeah, they uh they definitely like feed each other hmm. mutually. Yeah. Interesting. You know, we need to take a break. Uh, when we get back, I want to talk a little bit about. You mentioned that you realize you're queer, and that was kind of like the beginning of your deconstruction. But I want to flesh that out a little bit more and see what that looked like. We will be right back right after this. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> Welcome back to the life after. I am Brady. I'm here with Chuck and Caitlin. Caitlin, um, you had mentioned earlier about how whenever you realize you're queer, that was kind of the inciting incident for your deconstruction. Can you kind of flesh that out a little bit? I want to hear that story. Yeah, definitely. So um, I did never realize I might be queer. Very few people believe that because if you look at pictures of me growing up, I look like a huge lesbian. Um, I was definitely like queer flagging without realizing it for most of my childhood. Um, But uh, my senior year of college, I was living with three other girls, um, four other girls, four other girls. Um, three of whom were the other fellow, the other leadership of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which I <laughs> of which of which I was also a member, and the um, fifth, who was a godless atheist, um, and then <laughs> she seduced me unintentionally. Um, oh my! So we like got to be very very close friends very quickly because we were super gay for each other and um, made plans to live together after graduation. Um, she was making me breakfast most mornings and we were having naked cuddles at night in a very uh, yeah. heterosexual way. Like you didn't even realize that this was a romantic. No, that connection no. wasn't there. No, no, I we're talking about being so deep in the compulsive heterosexuality and like being like a good Christian girl. Like I had no awareness, um, which is, I know it's ridiculous, but I'm, that is the honest experience of my life was I was completely blindsided and so, um, in January of that year, we ended up fooling around by accident in, in very much a like, which is another thing people are like, that's bullshit. I was like, no, really? Like her nipple was in my mouth. And I was like, wow, this seems not straight. Like this, <laughs> this seems <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> like, um, uh, not heterosexual. Um, and so that was pretty stressful. She was great. But I freaked out a lot. That week, I was supposed to be doing a self-designed internship. And um, one day, for sure, just, like, drove to the internship location and couldn't make myself go in. And then drove to a church and just, like, cried in the parking lot um, Hmm. in my car. And I I had been not fully deconstructing, but definitely, like, departing from some of the more conservative tenets of my Christianity um, throughout college. So starting sophomore year, I, like discovered feminism on tumblr on the internet and was like oh shit like yeah this seems obvious 
Um, uh-huh. And so it had been a couple years in the making of really like questioning, um, just questioning tenants that I had been taught questioning. I had been questioning whether or not like damnation based on homosexuality was something that I wanted to put any stock in. Uh, Mm -hmm. partly because of like all the shame I had that I was like, I'm like reading all of these romantic interactions between queer characters and it's giving me a lot of joy. So it's pretty fucked up if I think that there's like something fundamentally wrong with that. Um, Mm. so I was, I was sitting with a lot of that, but it was like a whole different ball game when it was like my actual life and my actual identity and like things that I thought to be true about myself and my community, like weren't true anymore. Um, so yeah, we uh, continued fooling around and just didn't talk about it until April, and then she got drunk. We got drunk on tequila, and she professed her love to me, and I was like, "Oh yeah, same." And then we Tequila's moved good to New Orleans. That. Tequila was great for that, and then we moved to New Orleans together, and we got married this February. Um, Very cool. What a story! Yeah. What a story! <laughs> the wild ride. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so you. Your wife is the les is the lesbian atheist you were mentioning. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think technically she's agnostic, but she's a very cold agnostic. She's very firmly in the camp of I have no, I, like I have no, like I have no data. Um, and she wasn't a lesbian, so she hadn't. Neither of us. We're both fat babes, and um, that adds this whole other layer of like desirability politics and like mm-hmm. finding partners in high school mm-hmm. or having those experiences mm-hmm. early on. So neither of us have had ever been with anybody else. Like our first kiss was was our first kiss, which oh, didn't wow. come until a while after we actually fooled around. And then I was like, oh, we shouldn't do that. That makes us gay. Um, sure. So that was a whole thing i had a whole construction where if i didn't get off i was just showing her love and it wasn't gay like there's been so many boxes yeah 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 Um, we did that we do that i mean i remember telling myself yeah i just want to i just want to experiment with a guy i don't want to have a relationship with one right i have no romantic Uh. feelings but then eventually you (laughs) know realize that's not real life that's that's like more gay also i (laughs) I know I feel like just wanting to fuck a guy is more yeah, gay yeah, yeah. than wanting to like love and marry gay, a guy. I just want to suck a dick. <laughs> right? Like, no, but you know, we real, we real make struggle. those weird cater, uh, categorization cater, categorizations. Categorizations, categorizations. categorizations categorizations in our minds. And it's like, what the fuck, right? Like, yeah. it's... Because uh, we compartmentalize it in weird fucking ways because I know like when I grew up, we had a lot of like that... Um, well, if you're gay, it's because your parents did this, this, or this. But it was mm. still our fault that, right? Like my oh, my parents fully. My mom fully. We did one family therapy session. So I um I waited a full year to tell them we we moved to New Orleans together. They moved us in together. We had two separate bedrooms. Um, and I waited a full year to make sure it was legit and on lock because I was like, if I'm gonna give my parents a heart attack. It better be fucking for real. Um, And so I waited a full year to tell them. My mom cried. We did a family therapy session that December. And yeah, my mom had been reading conservative Christian propaganda that like made it all her fault. Um, Oh, God. There was some there's I think there was some (sighs) weird awareness of the like trauma of like my dad's abusive and toxic behaviors because he definitely I don't know if she told me he felt this way or if it came out somehow. He somehow like had guilt about like his behavior and oh how it like God. made me afraid of men and like that's why I was queer. Which like the the fucked up thing is like he's not entirely wrong. Like there's a right, reason I right. stayed very far away uh, yeah. from romantic uh, interactions with um, people with penises. Although I'm not opposed to people with penises. Um, yeah, it's. It was a wild ride. It's, it's this weird sure. that happens a lot, actually, and it's it's interesting because it's like th- this thing. This is like a really hard thing for you to do, Caitlin, and you're like inviting your family into this space, and then it like suddenly becomes about them feeling really bad. Oh, it's the, like it turns into time. a yeah. It's oh, it's so the absurd. Whole time. It sucks. I mean, we it's uh, this- it sucks. It's not really it's not really their fault because that's just what they have been told over and over and over. I don't to know. Some degree. I mean, my uh, I burnt. I they had some book. They had they had some book on homosexuality being a sin, and I stole it when they were moving, good, and I yeah, yeah, we tossed it. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, the the hardest thing from that session was he, my dad, like very earnestly, he, he told me that I kept telling them that I had done everything I could to make this as easy on them as possible because I had, like I hadn't shared my relationship with friends um, for the most part. Like there were a few old friends that I had grown up with that I called like I was out in New Orleans, but my like life in Texas, like nobody knew. And, um, and I told my sister as time went on, cause she's awesome and didn't give a shit. Um, <laughs> but like um, my dad told me like, like all you keep saying is how you've worked so hard to make this easy on us. And, and he essentially said like that meant shit to them. Um, mm. he also said wow. that like, he said that they would have been prepared for a child who was like a drug addict or an alcoholic, but they weren't prepared for this, oh which like God. understanding that like my grandfather, one, some of the, one of the reasons my mom is so deeply traumatized is that my grandfather absolutely was an alcoholic and absolutely did cause like a lot of harm and was violent and abusive in many, many ways. And that I, it was just like this wild, it sucks because I, I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be good, but like it, it's like a whole different thing when people are like regurgitating this like vitriolic stuff that like, you, you know, they're, you know, they're not looking at it with a full lens, but it's just, it, it sucks to have to sit and like navigate that space. Yeah. Yep. Mm. It sure does. Yeah. I mean like you're really, you're so, <laughs> it's, it takes so much emotional energy to, to be there in that space with your parents. And right. then suddenly you're like, they're both on your shoulders and you're like trying to help them feel better about yeah. like, oh, well, it's really not your fault. And that's a lie. And that's bullshit. But like, I really shouldn't have to explain that to you in this moment, you know? Right. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Like you like you're supposed to be the one that is like <laughs> further down the line psychologically. But that's not the case. Well, and that was what I mean. They had mentioned my mom had mentioned this book in this session that we did together. And. I was like, why, like, why are, how, does that seem helpful? My dad was like really upset and immediately was like, you don't get to tell us what we go to for comfort. And I was like, uh, like, do you feel comforted? Like, does this, do y'all seem, do you feel better yeah. having like ingested this bullshit? Like, is this improving the situation for you? And then he couldn't say anything to that. Cause I was like, no, it's, it's not like you can try and like retaliate and be nasty because you're really uncomfortable and upset. But, like, I'm just honestly asking, like, does that seem like a choice that's actually helping you in yeah. this situation? Is I'm, what you're reading, like, helping? It feels it feels comfortable when you're a Christian to be able to blame yourself for things. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. Well, be, well because there's no, there's no consequences for it because you're forgiven. So oh, it's well, like, that's also true. You know, it's like, yeah, you, you get that shame, that buzz from the shame, but really there's no consequences from it. You're not really taking responsibility. But, right. Like Kaylee, if you haven't felt bad about it yet, you haven't gotten through it if you, when you're a Christian. You know what I mean? That's kind of the gauge, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. How, how bad do you feel about yourself? Bad? All right, good. It's your next job. Mm, good. <laughs> Kaylin, one thing yeah. I'm noticing about you is, you've you did therapy i'm assuming because you really <laughs> seem like 100 percent. okay because like <laughs> you seem so fucking like articulate with being able to express your feelings in a way that i'm like you don't get to that level and you don't get to that sort of like self-awareness unless professional work has been done I mean, for sure. Like I've, I've been in there. I think it's two years now. There's been breaks as like one therapist went on maternity leave. And then, um, as I like, haven't had health insurance for like six months. Um, but also like as, as a person who was emotionally abused, like I am, I, I pick up on the motions of others very easily and readily. I'm able to articulate it very easily and readily. Um, like I, I attribute a lot of my empathy and a lot of my ability to articulate what I'm navigating and experiencing and ordering that with like being deeply traumatized yeah. <laughs> and like yeah. having to like, like it being a safety situation of like, am I reading the room? Right. Am I, am I catching the difference in tone? Right. Like, am I like, am I perceiving what I can say that will help the situation and what I can say that will escalate the situation? Um, are things that I've been doing since I was five or younger. And so you do, you do become somebody who for me and you know, yeah. 
uh, I'm and my my dad was very verbal and in the way the way that he was my best friend he was also a person who was engaging me in dialogue as if I were a peer and or an adult mm, from yeah. a very early age um which is like not super great and healthy in some ways and in other ways like I've always had I I've, I've had the ability then to to navigate those conversations and verbalize what I'm thinking like very well but yeah, no, therapy is great. And if talk therapy works for you <laughs> and if you have health coverage, like I think every, I think most folks can benefit. I won't say everyone, oh but I God, think most yeah. folks can benefit. We talk about that on the show a lot because we know a lot of fundamentalism it doesn't, it, it's um, it t- intimidated by therapy, mm-hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. my dad, uh, my dad told me that therapy was for folks who didn't have friends. Wow, okay. and that's not him. How? Yeah, yeah. I was like, right, <laughs> man, right. To, talking to your daughter about your problems is also things for th- things for people that don't, <laughs> people have, who friends. don't have friends. Jesus, yeah, woof. Yeah, a lot of hot takes. So, Caitlin, let's uh, let's just let's just skip right to it, right? Okay, so yeah, you're. Yeah, uh, you mentioned you mentioned some group sex earlier, so I'm, I did. It seems that you're not in a traditional sex. monogamous relationship of of sorts. Um, you are you you identify as polyamorous, or you are in a polyamorous relationship, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that language works fine. Um, okay, I I know that there's uh, like 200 different ways to say so that, many, and they mean a lot so of different, different things. And I I mean I'm a person who I mean I'm a pansexual panentheist uh polyamorous switch oh non-binary also so i don't like uh, boxes don't work super well for me <laughs> right uh, yeah so yeah so i don't i don't have a lot of particular language um but yeah there are like 200 terms for it but yeah so um i guess it was not last winter but the winter before that i had like stumbled across i don't know how this happened i had we had a few friends who were polyamorous um, our close friends had had begin uh, structuring their relationship that way and exploring that. And I think I just like had a lot of questions because I am really it takes a lot for me to feel safe with one person. And I was like, wow, what kind of emotional vulnerability do you have to be willing to lay on the table to have like romantic dynamics with multiple people? Like that's mm-hmm. wild. That's wild. So I. I think actually my, my wife's a librarian, so she, uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, she brought home Tikva Wolf has a, has a comic strip series that's compiled into a book called Ask Me About Polyamory. And so I read this book um, and loved it. And I thought the like relationship outlook that set into it was like super beautiful. Um, I don't know if Tikva describes their work as being from like a relationship anarchy perspective, but it's definitely this like non-hierarchical, like, I just open my heart and whoever the universe brings into my life to make connections with, we just make connections in an authentic uh-huh. way. And, and I was like, Oh, that's beautiful. And so I like drafted a relationship manifesto about my central core values and what I was bringing to the table and what I was looking for. And because that's, you know, how it works. And, um, <laughs> very yeah. intellectually like approached this conversation with my wife where I was like, Hey, like, I think, I think it might be cool. Like, I think this aligns with our values. Um, so we're like radically leftist, community based like you know all that good hippie shit um <laughs> yeah and i was like i think this aligns i think this aligns with our values like i think i want to try this and she initially was like very scared and skeptical and was mm. like this is not like i don't see myself being interested in this and um well, but let me let me interrupt you for a yeah. second what were her hesitations what did she what did she communicate she was uh it was uh, if you don't mind, uh, it's, I don't, you know. It's cool. No, okay. I got her consent. Okay, okay, um, okay. I, I meant to get the consent of all my partners and totally didn't. So I'm going to be speaking kind of vaguely and generally at different points. But she is fine with all of this. Okay. Um, so, I mean, she was essentially, I had a lot of insecurity and anxiety about, like, if I, and, and some of it is from, I, looking back on it as somebody who's now been having these conversations, some of it's from this lens of toxic monogamy which is that, like, mm. if I can't fulfill all of your needs, then, like, we weren't meant then to be what, e- right. what, even, what even are we to right, each other? Right. Um, which, uh, ironically, I would say I struggle with that way more at this point than she does. Um, and then some of it was just this insecurity of, like, like who, what if who you find is, like, more attractive or more fun or, and, and you, you would yeah. rather be them? Um, yeah. So that was kind of her initial feelings and... 
And I had this incredibly idealized idea that like I was going to go into the world with my relationship manifesto and find people to have like uh-huh. soul connections with and like we were going to help each other better each other as people and it was going to be beautiful sure, um, yeah. which is not what most people on OkCupid are looking for actually <laughs> I don't want to like, shatter anybody's uh, perception of the world but the dating market is not saturated with people looking to authentically grow with one another and soul connection right 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 yeah <laughs> yeah so, so yeah, we, I was the person who kind of had this idea and like intellectually it made sense. I'm like, cool, it aligns with my values. Let's go, let's do it. And then when we actually started seeing other people, I struggled with it and hated it way more than Sarah did. And Sarah found that it was really empowering and fun for her to have these interactions with other people. Uh-huh. And I was like, yeah. No, wait, I'm deeply traumatized and opening up to anybody is terrifying to me. Why the fuck did I think this was a good idea? I feel like that is such a common, (laughs) that is such a, like, hilariously common trope almost in polyamory is that, like, you talk your partner into it and then your partner either thrives, like, in a way that you can't or loves it. And, like, you're, like, you know, you're the one that's, like, struggling to, like, oh, really yeah. dive mm-hmm. in, you know? And it's, oh, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's funny. Talk you know, I mean, it's game, just, like... Right. It's not, I don't think there's too much to that. I just think that, that it, that's kind of sometimes how right. it goes. And, it's re- right. that's, and that's what's interesting about it is once you like flip that switch in a relationship is you don't really know what's going to happen. Nope. It's a, it's, a whole, it's a whole Pandora's box can yep. of worms from there. Um, yeah. And so we, I guess we've, it would have been a year in, in, this, in J- Janu- December, January. I think we originally had the conversation in, in December-ish. Um, and yeah, so we, we tried, we've done, we've had a variety of experiences. Um, I feel like for both of us, as people who didn't date in high school or call it, like as people who didn't date, didn't even really date each other, we mm-hmm. moved in together and then just like never moved out. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> like... <laughs> Um, that sounds like a forty-year-old man describe, or like an eighty-year-old man describing his marriage. Well, we moved in together one day, and then we never moved out. Well, the, the joke I always made is like the, the we, with the lesbians, you always joke about U-hauling, and like yeah. we just oh, yeah. we just like For skipped sure. that yeah. step completely. <laughs> yeah. um, but so yeah, I mean, I feel like that because neither of us had those other experiences, it's been super valuable, and I've learned a lot about how I operate, and it's. I mean, I wanted to do polyamory because I thought it was a way to continuously challenge ourselves, to continually put ourselves in situations where we were going to have to examine ourselves and have to examine how we were in relationship with each other and with Mm. other people. And as much, and like the last two years have been really fucking hard. And that has been my reminder to myself of like, this is literally what you wanted. <laughs> like, this sure, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Actively, like, you made choices to intentionally bring challenges into your life. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I had this, I have this deep fear of becoming like my parents and not being, not being open and not being willing to self reflect um, mm. and being, being very stuck and being very stagnant. And so, I really did see polyamory's way of like, well, if I'm constantly turning the pot, I can never get stagnant. Um, right. Which is not to say there's like a revolving door of partners because that's not where I'm at at all. Sure. It's more like, it's more like I will. If we constantly have to change and adapt when we're in relationship with other people, then I can only be further f- forced in a very positive way to change and adapt if I'm in relationship, an intimate relationship with multiple people. Let me, let me stop you for a second because you said, you said a few things that I want to unpack a little bit. Uh, <laughs> sure. First of all, like y- you talk, I mean, you talked about how like, d- how it requires so much like introspection into your relationship, into your partner, into yourself. And yeah. it requires like a ton of communication. And I, oh my God. one of the yeah. things I really appreciate about various forms of non-monogamy is that you communicate things to your partner that you would never ever ever communicate to them if you were not considering introducing other partners into the scenario right and it's like i think that's really cool and i think it's a i think it's a challenge that a lot of couples could probably grow from a lot like even ones that would never consider Mm -hmm. being poly or being non-monogamous or being poly what what's your experience with that? Like what what kind of kind of conversations do you have to have? Yeah, I mean, I was having a. I think there's many things that are that way. I was having a conversation with 
um, one of my partners the other day about how like being queer is like being able to see the matrix because all of a sudden all of these like compulsive heterosexuality dynamics that don't seem healthy like are super obvious because you don't fit um and i would say being non-binary is the same way like Mm. it's it's like it's like you see stuff and you're like but are you doing that because you want to because if you're doing it for any other reason it doesn't make sense to me as somebody Mm. that that doesn't it doesn't feel like it applies um and so i would say poly being polyamorous or ethically non-monogamous um is the same way in that like this structure i I really envision it as like chicken wire there's like chicken wire structure of like this is how your relationship is supposed to look when you shift your perspective and tilt that and do something different and weird quote unquote with it you are constantly having to see through bullshit that might be societally projected that you picked up from your parents that you've picked up from from past relationships we we don't necessarily fall in that bucket um as much but i know a lot of people do um I've, I've felt like it's very obvious the ways that my behavior has been changed by being her long-term partner because when I show up with that stuff with another partner, it's like, oh, there's no reason for me to behave this way. Like if, if this works for you better mm-hmm. or, if, or if this makes more sense for our connection, mm-hmm. then, then there's no reason for me to maintain this behavior pattern that I established with somebody else. And in fact, while I'm taking the moment to consider it, do, do I even want to establish that behavior part pattern with this other partner? With, like yeah, maybe right, I've, right, right. Maybe I've fallen into some kind of rhythm or routine that actually doesn't work for Sarah and I as much as it doesn't work for whoever else I'm engaging with. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you're really adaptable. Know. That's really cool to be able to kind of constantly be evolving and yeah, with your circumstances change. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of value checking for me. Value checking is a really good way to put it. I've, I've, my experience with, with non-monogamy has been uh, sort of, it can be really intimidating when you talk about the amount of communication that it requires. But like at the end of the day, not a lot changes in practice. Like that happens very slowly over time, but a lot changes in like sort of concepts or like the way you perceive the relationship, but like, you're still going to like, you know, cuddle up on the couch and watch you know kimmy schmidt or whatever at the end of the day you know what i mean or whatever you do whatever you do is what you're going to continue doing and like the communication i think is sort of because like you like what you're doing and you don't want to mess it up or yeah because you know if you hit a roadblock you need to change something about it but it's like that all happens pretty gradually so it's not like a it's not like this big intimidating right change you just sort of talk as it happens you know right that's absolutely true i mean i know that um we were already i mean as queer femme folks like we were already our our arguments and conflicts looked like our, us talking about our feelings for two hours and crying like it wasn't <laughs> sure. it wasn't like <laughs> right <laughs> it, it wasn't like we weren't doing that and so um i've actually had the experience of challenging some of that because if i allow myself to intellectualize and analyze my relationships as much as i want i it's no longer tenable with multiple partners like Mm. i need to actually be enjoying my time with them so it's been this exercise and like forced embodiment which is something i really struggle with and has been really good for me um yeah so i mean you can't the processing for me was like well this is already something i love to do anyway and so i don't mind doing it but then most of what I've experienced is it's just practical logistics. It's just sure. communication has to like increase as, um, as, as multiple moving pieces are coming into the yeah, equation. I, li- I right? like that you, I like that you said that because there is, <laughs> there's like only so much time in a week. And oh so my God. <laughs> I was kind of, I was kind of like chuckling when you were describing like your idealized, like, idea of polyamory because i'm like dude uh, like (laughs) if you have more than one even like relatively casual partner you are like at best like you're jumping in when you need to you know what i mean like (laughs) there's only so much energy like you can have like there's a lot of ways to do it you can have a primary partner that you're investing most of your emotional energy in there's all kinds of ways you can arrange that but like I, like logistically like you are struggling to find the time and energy to keep up with everybody right. <laughs> yeah 100 percent. like so sarah and i are currently we're in a committed long-term par- partnership with another couple um so we're in a quad which is not super common um and 
Yeah, I had a friend of mine, I mentioned somebody who I thought was cute, as like, I like had a crush on them, and she was like, oh, well, like, you know, like, they, they're down to hook up, and I was just like, yeah, I mean, I'll pencil them in somewhere, <laughs> right. like, I'm, like, that's cool, and if it happens... What's the 23rd looking like, yeah. <laughs> right, it, it, if it, uh, if it happens organically, that's great, because I'm, I love, I right. love beautiful organic connections, and also, there's no part of me that, like, feels like I need to make that happen, or force it, sure. like... Because I might like the the thing we say frequently is like my dance card's full. Like there's just yeah, there's yeah, just yeah. not I a like lot that. of I love um, it. Um, which I think is a that it's not something I've personally experienced. And I think maybe it's just because I do not I I do not now and have never carried myself like somebody who is just like trying to find as many partners as possible. Um, but I know that's a common stereotype of polyamorous people is that like you're out trying to hook up like every weekend. Um, which I think we need to critically analyze why that's a problem and why that's right, anything right. anybody should feel negatively about. But also for my part, I'm just like that you, you can't actually like, it takes a very specific personality to want to do that. And I find the prospect of that exhausting. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest. So, so I'm much more extroverted than my wife, Sarah is. And, and I quickly discovered that that has nothing to do with anything. And the process of like, connecting with somebody and like putting yourself out there which i had never done until my adult life like i'd never mm -hmm. flirted or sent mm -hmm. cold messages or tried to arrange dates that process was so excruciatingly painful and stressful and anxiety inducing that like for the most part like people can have it like it's i don't i, I discovered after a lifetime of wondering why i had never dated and what was wrong with me that i had never dated that i actually hate dating um i hate it so much yeah um yeah, so so a lot of the constructions about like what it must look like um, <laughs> just uh -huh. really miss really miss the mark for right, me personally right, right, and yeah. from my experience. For sure, uh, I'm going to ask you a, a, an annoying question on purpose, um, yeah. just to see what you what your response to it is. Um, well, how how does how would one know if they are a polyamorous person? Ooh, it's a good question. It's, it's a fine question. It's fine. Um, so I, th I think folks, it's annoying personally, but <laughs> I don't, I've never been asked that. I mean, I'm okay. not, I'm not super out as poly. Like all of my friends know, but most of my friends are polyamorous also, right. or have some construction of non-monogamy in their partnership. So sure. it's like not really a thing we talk about too much. Yep. Um, and I don't, you know, um, in my position, I've just started, I've been open with a few people on an individual level. I have multiple partners, but it's not a thing that I'm like broadcasting. Sure. Um, but, um, so there are people who feel that being polyamorous is an orientation. Um, right. and I don't want to invalidate that experience. Um, just in the same way, there's people who think that kink is an orientation. Sure. Don't want to invalidate that experience. I personally made such a conscious choice that like for these intellectual reasons and because of my values, I am going to choose to structure my relationship in this way. Yeah. Um, like for me, it was a, it was a relationship structure choice. Um, so for somebody who says, how would I know if you're polyamorous? I would say if you try it and you like it, then I guess you're polyamorous. Yeah. 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 For mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah. like, uh, you know, in the same way that like my favorite color is green because I like green things. Yeah. Like it's just, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, just like, do you, do you like it or not? It's one right. of many options. Or if it's um, like repulsive to you, maybe you're probably right. not. <laughs> and, and like, <laughs> a good I do, I do think you have to, I think you have to be willing to do deep internal, scary, vulnerable growth work. I think your partner yeah. has to be willing to do it with you. That yeah. is how I approach it. So there are there are people who do a wide variety of things. Um, the way I go about it and the way my partners go about it, for the most part, because um, some connections are, are deeper and operate in different levels than others, um, is like, you want to put in the work. And so it's hard in that way. Um, and it's challenging in that way. But I also wanted to take on those challenges because I thought the net reward would be meaningful to my life and my development as a person and an individual. Yep. So like to me, I'm like, if you try it and it doesn't like, this is a good example. Um, when we first started um, engaging with other people. So a lot of the times this looked like connected with somebody on a dating app and like flirting or sexting or sending nudes or whatever. Um, Sarah discovered that it was super empowering for her to send like, like cute, sexy photos, like not always nudes, but just like, like a lot of selfies, a lot of yeah. sharing of images like that. I do 
not like that. Uh-huh. I hate that. I am incredibly, uh, I'm very uncomfortable. I don't like most pictures I take. And so for me, the net gain of whatever validation I might get that for, from that person was not worth the risk of like, what if they didn't respond in a way that I found affirming? Or what if they waited too long? Like, I'm just going to sit there with anxiety the whole time. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's a problem for somebody to send loots. Um, that means yeah. for me, when I weighed it, it didn't feel better for me to do that than to not. Sure. And that might be a that thing that, like, if, if I determine it's a priority for me over time that I want to work on that and change that and become more comfortable with doing that, I can choose that priority. Um, but so that's my, for people who might want to explore non-monogamy, I'm like, look at the net gain. Do you think the experiences you're going to get are going to outweigh the fact that you are going to have to put in some deep work on sure. communication yeah. in you and your partner? And if it doesn't, then, then don't. Then don't do it. If you, are, if you are fulfilled and don't see that there's something you would gain by like doing this internal work and, and changing your relationship structure, then don't. And there's no, there's no judgment. It doesn't mean you're less enlightened. It means you took stock of your internal needs and, and said, you know what, that's going to be too much for me to sign on to right now. And it can Killer. change because we're fluid, you know? That is a really, that is a fantastic answer. I was like, yeah, it, the reason I think it's annoying is like basically what you said is like, I'm not entirely sure that it's an orientation, you know, mm-hmm. I think it's just like, so, I think it is more active than anything, you know, cause it's right. like, there aren't, there, there aren't a lot of like living human sexual people that are like dead set on only having sex with one person like almost everybody at least has the impulse occasionally to like have sex with another person right and like for me like i was that person for five years yeah 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 we had only been each other's physical or sexual partners and i was completely satisfied like i we had we had great sex we had a great physical relationship like i was happy i was in no way like I need to experience sex with a penis before I die. Although it is like a nice perk that I've now had that experience. Like uh-huh. I, I think if, if there are experiences you want to have and you can't have them within a non monogamous, within a monogamous structure, then like look at all the options that are available to you. And that's sure. my big, like there are some people that are real evangelical about polyamory and that's not yeah. really my thing. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, if it's one of many options, if it's an option that seems sure. like it, fits or works for you then like that's great then you should do that there's lots yeah. my sister is asexual like yeah but not a sex repulsed asexual person like a sex positive asexual person she sure. just doesn't when she weighs the net gains of like do i want to have sexual relationships with people or not it just doesn't weigh in that favor for her so yeah. like there's like lots and lots of different ways to be a person in the world and we are really committed to putting a lot of boxes on it and i think we'd be, all be a lot happier if we just looked at the full buffet and picked what we wanted. So I want to rewind a little bit and talk about, uh, like you mentioned pretty early on, I think you were uh, I'm trying to think of the context. You were talking about, um, I think you were talking about your dad's relationship with people at church or lack thereof or whatever. And how, right. how like, and how like but effectively you were saying that like the space within church to communicate one's feelings or one's like deepest struggles is often often falls short right especially for men but for really for literally everybody in in church it's like the like they put you in these scenarios and then it's like these are the people that you can be safe with we all believe the same thing god is present with us quote unquote and this is your time to like talk about something but like the one person that opens up about how insanely depressed they are like really doesn't get much of a validation right. in that right. experience right so i want to talk about the concept of intimacy because mm. i think like there's like intense and really unique intimacy in polyamory and it like juxtaposing that to compare and contrast to the quote unquote intimacy that exists in church is like amusing to me at on a good yeah. you know it's like oh man. like oh yeah, yeah well yeah this is like exact the exact opposite of what they told me to do in church and yet i'm experiencing like much more like oh uh, yeah meaningful no, relationships go I- ahead yeah, I will always talk about intimacy and polyamory and relationships. Yeah, so part of my big relationship manifesto was like, I'm, I'm going to be non-hierarchically polyamorous. I'm going to be a relationship anarchist, meaning that 
not only will I not have a primary partner, although like obviously I de facto basically have a primary partner, which mm-hmm. is why all of those labels and intellectualization like sometimes miss their mark in the real world. Um, I'm they're, not gonna have a primary like, partner. Yeah, they're there for a reason, but they're it's right. rarely like what actually happens it's, anyway. It's an internal for me. It was an internal delineation that mattered, but for the purposes of most people engaging with me, wouldn't change how we engaged with one another. Um, so yeah. In addition to that, it was like, I'm non-hierarchical, I'm a relationship anarchist, meaning that my friends and my, my platonic relationships are just as valuable to me as my romantic partnerships. All of my romantic partners are equal. So everybody's on the same playing field. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not going to, most of this, uh, many, many times in our culture, like this, this romantic partnership is set up at the very tippy top, and then everything else is lanyap, right? Like once you find your soulmate, that person's going to meet all your social and emotional needs. Um, you, them and God, you know, from a Christian perspective, it's like your, your spouse and God are the people that are going to meet all your social and emotional needs. Right. And everybody else is like important community, but they're the base of the mountain. Um, uh-huh. They're not the peak of it. So I wanted to really intentionally diverge from that and really like, in whatever way I could maximize my friendships and platonic relationships and not, not automatically and unconsciously see them as secondary. Mm, So there's the, the experience of intimacy when that happens, not just with friends, but also with strangers um, was huge. Like I discovered Mm. that I was being more present with cashiers and I was being more present Mm. with, Mm. with my friends. And it, it was because I had, Partly in this kind of shitty, like, consumable way of like, wow, if I wanted, if I really wanted to, I could give you my number. Um, sure, sure, but, sure. But also just but there's, in this, there's like, something to that. That's not even like, yeah, that's not superficial, right? That's like autonomy. Right. It's like the practice of autonomy. Yeah. And so I mean, it definitely. I I feel like I'm a, more holistically appreciate people's like physical beauty, like because because it doesn't require a romantic connection. Sure. It's no longer it's no longer like well I found my person I got it unlocked like I've got somebody I'm coming home to. It's like everybody has something to offer me and and I have something I can offer them. You know, depending on how our paths cross. Mm-hmm. Um, and it creates windows for a lot more of that intimacy because it's just like i'm not trying to force anything i'm not putting anybody in any category um like i'm just gonna show up and be honest about where i am that day and that might look like me showing up with friends and being honest about the kind of day i've had um and it might look like me like going out on a date and being honest about what i'm afraid of and like what i'm looking for um and 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 it's entirely different than a lot of what I saw in church growing up, which was instead of being okay with ourselves and where we were, it was everything was focused externally and Uh everything was focused outward. So what I've found not only in polyamory, but generally in a, like a, a more leftist worldview um, has been like, which is so interesting because it was said, it, it was always told to me that it was the opposite, but the life I have now is more meant to be about, the peace I have internally and like Mm. who I am internally and what I value and what I'm prioritizing internally and less about an external marker of that. Sure. Uh, Whereas in Christianity, it was always this level of like, am I doing enough? Am I measuring up? Like, am I? Yeah. Am I? Well, and it's also like the external marker marker is there. So let's make sure that like we fulfill the marker. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's instead of the other way around. Right. right, like this is what is, so we can put a, a, a label on it so people can see it if we want, but otherwise it's just what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, and there's not that constant engagement with it, which sure. which I think is, for me, has been like a really core value. Like everything's changing and I want to be constantly checking in and doing pulse checks on myself and my relationships and yeah. my values. Totally. Have you had any like any like notable bad experiences that you've learned from in the in the process? Oh God, so many. Um, <laughs> well, that means so that many. it doesn't work, right? Because you you've had bad experiences. I don't know. I'm also like <laughs> no new, like in- incredibly happy. So there's that also. Um, yeah. So I <laughs> I went out on my first ever, <laughs> I guess more than once. Um, I don't know if one of them counted as a date. I don't think that one counted as a date because we really just met to hook up. But um, sure. 
I went on my first ever date with a cishet dude, and it was it was, oh, yeah. it was an okay date, and the sex wasn't great, um, and that was a short-lived interaction uh-huh. uh, that I the the person reminded me of my dad. Oh, uh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's comes in the sense. They they had the same job and uh, okay. very ar- very articulate, very verbal, very argumentative, um, and I was like, okay, like this is my this is my moment of getting this opportunity on a silver platter. Sure. Because um, I was I I've, I've long had the fear that like if an ab- if abusive dynamics cropped up in my life again that I wouldn't leave or that I wouldn't be able to to extricate myself uh, or protect yeah. myself, um, and so I I had. I met this person and this person, it was a wild, I accidentally super liked him the first night I was on Tinder. Oh yeah. That, um, yeah. Everybody's done and that we, one. Um, so we, we message and immediately set up a date for the next night. And then I like deleted the app. So it's like the only, it's like my Tinder experience. <laughs> uh, That's the whole thing is accidentally super liking somebody and then deleting it. <laughs> well, and it was so like, like it was an accident and then it was so weirdly appropriate um, with how it lined up with like all of my shit that I was like, this has to be an opportunity from the universe to sure. face my fears and learn some lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which, yeah, which I did. I mean, I, I had a series of very very poor sexual encounters and um and then like ended things when when he continued to be combative and like not take responsibility for his own shit and like not be in relationship in the ways that it's important to me to be in relationship and so i like i like learned what i wanted to learn which is that like in that position i can do that and i can separate myself and move on with my life and not 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 feel any kind of way except that like I'm glad I had the experience and, and I hope, I hope he's okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, so I had that experience. I had several experiences of hyper romanticizing people who oh, yeah. weren't looking for the same things I was because I was looking for lifelong soul connections with every single person. And as sure. I mentioned, there's not as many people uh, looking for that. Uh-huh. Um, so I had two or, I have two or three, four, four connections with people that, uh, you know, I immediately five immediately <laughs> jumped into like trying to make it a romantic connection sure. when it was really like sexual or barely anything at all. Right. Um, and that really sucked. And I was really anxious for those experiences and uh-huh. it was really stressful. And also like, I like looking back now, like now it's been about a year. Um, like, I know that I'm would not navigate those situations in the same way today. I know. And I, and I now have connections that are much more chill sure. that I'm enjoying a lot more because I'm not the same person. And I'm not in the same place as I was when like, I like didn't feel. And, and for me, it really came down to like romantic and sexual intimacy. Didn't feel safe unless there was deep, deep emotional intimacy because I, I really like expect people to hurt me and not stop hurting me. Um, so like, it's been really, really good for me and empowering for me to be able to look at my progression over time and look at like where I wasn't safe. I did not feel safe taking those risks. And I really wanted to like force things into like this romantic box because like, well, if you're my boyfriend or if you're my girlfriend or if you're my partner, then that these rules go with that. And then you're less likely to hurt me. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of literature. There's, there's a really great, podcast called multi amory that gets into all that stuff but there's there's a lot of resources available for why that doesn't work and why the only thing that really assuages those fears and anxiety is like doing internal work and sitting with ourselves right. and knowing that like so other cool. people yeah. like aren't meeting those needs for us like we that's need to kinda, meet our that's kind of the thing and that's kind of like why i asked you about those bad experiences and you you nailed the response because it's like you people are so afraid particularly surrounding sexuality and romanticism that like they are going to get hurt. And it's as if that experience doesn't teach you something valuable, you know, or like about yourself. And the interesting thing about polyamory is that there's like a little bit less weight on those relationships when they don't work out, when you have other partners or when it's not really your thing to just have one partner. It's like, oh, that didn't work out, but like I still have these people that like care about me a lot, you know? And, and for, you can kind of go there for it. Yeah. And I think for me too, it's been less this like, 
and I, I have I have a very different experience than somebody who's practicing solo polyamory who doesn't have a long term partner that they cohabitate with. Sure, yeah. I mean, I really do, like I have a wife I'm going to come home to at the end of any experience. Right. Um, so that's very different. But it's not it's not that those relationships are able to be more casual and have less pressure because oh I I already got I got already got one in stock like I'm all set. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, that's not exactly. It's because what I mean. like you're not making a single romantic partner like the focus of your life and your identity so this yes. thing that so yeah. so many of us are like you're just waiting to find the person like all throughout young adult life it's like and you're just waiting to find your person and when you find your person then you can start doing all the things of adulthood and getting on that relationship escalator and yeah. buying getting married and buying a house and having kids and like doing all the things you're supposed to do <laughs> yeah 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 and basing all that and if like, one work. piece comes out the whole thing crumbles right, right. and it's like if you're basing all your worth on those external like milestones, then like what hap- like what happens if you lose any of those things? So that's, yeah. that's a thing that like with my parents, I know that a lot of their fear and anger is they had a life they constructed for me in their heads. Sure. And like they were receiving validation from me being the right kind of person and yeah. the right kind of daughter and like yeah. what they could see as me being successful. And and like if their worth wasn't based in that, if it was based in an internal sense of identity and, and peace and the generative struggle that we're all going through, then that wouldn't have been as painful for them, I don't think. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. there's, yeah, that's really well put. So uh, we need, we probably, we need to wrap up. Um, but you, you mentioned a few, you mentioned some resources. Uh, could you throw out some resources for our listeners? Sure. So like we're talking about polyamory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. all. Um, or, so, or like, yeah, just wh- whatever all. you got. Yeah, you're like a, you're like a resource person, but I, let's start, I, let's, um, uh, let's, you know what, we'll reduce it to polyamory just because <laughs> that's the, <laughs> I know you sure. have like so much, I can tell by your face that you're like, I don't know how many things I I'm going to list. Which, which topic do you want to talk about? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, the, the multi-amory podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Dedeker, Jace, and... Emily, um, I don't know their last names, but the Multi Amory podcast is an amazing resource for Multi Amory, specifically from this perspective. So, if you are a person who like wants to swing with your partner or find casual sexual relationships, I still think all of the tenets of good communication would be helpful to you. Sure. Um, because human like conflict is going to arise in human relationships, and like hurt is going to happen in human relationships. So, they're good things to have in your tool belt. But um, that podcast is amazing. More Than Two is a book that's amazing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Both um, the book, Ask Me About Polyamory, and also the comic strip series by Tikva Wolf. Um, it's called Kimchi Cuddles is the name of the <laughs> comic strip. Kimchi Cuddles, very nice. Cute. Yeah, I it's love very kimchi. cute. Um, is, is really like, if I wanted to just explain to people what my approach to relationships is, like I would just send them Tikva's um, materials. Cool. Um, the Ethical Slut is good. Yeah, that's what good. What else? What are other... Uh, I, I mean, opening, I've read opening up, which is pretty good. That's kind of like a cat. That's kind of like catalog style. Um, it's just yeah. like, these are all the different ways that people do it. And then these are the, all the different ideas yeah. that come with it. Yeah. I think those would be a good place yeah. to start. I, it seems pretty like good. some pretty accessible yeah. resources. Yeah, I would say so. There's also like, I have to do my plug, um, oh, for do. emergent, emergent strategy and pleasure activism by Adrian Marie Brown. Um, aren't about polyamory specifically. They're uh, more about like a set of practices and a perspective and worldview about like how to accept that we're constantly changing and how to be present and like work through our own shit in a way that's going to feel good for us and also Mm. move all of us towards like lives where hopefully we can do that better and more often. Um, Very much the foundation of my like political and spiritual worldview which sure. for me very much is like melded with why my relationships are structured this way and why they're meaningful to me um so those are great as well especially cool. i feel like pleasure pleasure activism i think specifically yeah surrounding like actually identifying what feels good for you and then pursuing that and not feeling shame or regret um and not apologizing for that uh feels important too mm. awesome very good well thank you so much thanks for sitting down with us I could. I want to just y'all. keep talking to you all night, but like, I guess we need to end the show at some point. So. 
This is really good. Yeah, some of us can't even get into one relationship. And so <laughs> uh, being well, in this conversation he, just kind of was a little bit of we're a just drag. Here, we're just here to shame you. Shame well, Bernie, you, you, know the, you know the hot take, right? The hot take is you are already in your most important relationship with yourself. That's the hot take. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we've been in that relationship for a long time, and I think that it's time to, it's time it's to see other rocky. people. It's time to see other people. You need to open up your self You need self to open up your relationship with yourself. Uh, yeah, we didn't even get into like uh, witchcraft and stuff, and I don't even care. I like I'm this sorry. is a good conversation. No, this is the conversation. Oh, we're yeah, supposed to yeah, have. yeah. So <laughs> this is really helpful. Um, and I think that it's going to be good for our listeners because it's going to op- offer some other opportunities. And what you were saying is so helpful of like just no matter who you are where you are figure out what works for you like quit trying to be a box that's supposed to fit into a square peg like or a you know circle peg you get the analogy right Uh, right. if if you're into pegging though like go for it you know if (laughs) if it's something you want to try oh my god we don't have time for that conversation (laughs) um But Caitlin, thank you so much for joining our show and uh, sharing your story with us. Yes. Um, so helpful. We'll have to have you back to talk about witchcraft. And I mean, I'll come back anytime. Hell yeah. Deal. And I like to talk. Chuck, tell us about um, our Facebook group. Uh, we have a private uh, Facebook group that is, uh, you have to answer a series of questions that is are c- carefully monitored by our... What is our, your name? What is your quest? What is the... Uh, what's your favorite color? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, by our admins and uh, to keep it a safe place to talk about your deconstruction process or talk about your religious trauma or what, whatever's going on with you that, um, you know... Uh, you need to talk about it. It's a really, it's a really great community. People are really responsive and, and thoughtful, and their exchanges there, and it's, and we're all kind of helping each other heal. And it's really cool. And we also have a Patreon. Yeah, and so our Patreon, uh, we've got several different layers there, levels that you can pick. Um, my favorite level is level ten because level we're, we'll, ten. ten dollars a month because we have the oh um, ten dollars. We have is we have a uh, exclusive seg- podcast segment of Chuck and I each month. Each like, month, so. yeah, where it's just us talking about stupid bullshit. No, I'm just kidding. It's actually pretty good, I think. And uh, <laughs> a favor that we ask from you all, if you enjoy the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. It really helps people find the show or wherever you listen to your podcasts uh, not just itunes so cool thank you all so much uh and we will be back soon here on the life after and remember if you don't go to church sunday Sundays, just, just a second, second saturday, saturday. <laughs> signing <laughs> off <laughs>